Welcome to Pretty Lies and Alibis. Let's seek the truth and travel the long road to justice together. What you know, alibiers. Welcome to another episode of Pretty Lies and Alibis. I'm Gigi. Good to have you here. It's Monday, April Fool's Day 1 of jury selection in the Chad Daybell trial. It's going on right now. I'm live streaming. Man, I tell you, for once, something with the computers went well. Boom. First time, stream up and running. We've got three, 400 people in there having a great chat as this goes along. This will be a daily thing throughout the trial. Even if I'm in Boise, I can leave a computer back at the hotel and live stream. So if I'm there, you guys can keep on chatting. We are finally here, y'all. Justice for JJ, Tally, and Tammy underway. Before we get started, if you're watching on YouTube, you know the drill. Don't forget to hit subscribe if you haven't already. Like the video, share it with your friends, and you can ring my bell if, if you want notifications of when I post new content. Just click that little bell icon. Music fact of the day. The song Somebody to Love was inspired by Aretha Franklin. Freddie Mercury was a huge fan of Aretha's and really wanted to do something in her style and also wanted this song to sound a bit like a gospel song. There you go. Now you know. Love Freddie Mercury. What a genius. We are going to jump right back in to part two of this refresher course before testimony starts. We've heard jury selection could take at least a week, maybe two. We'll see what happens, but we're going to be here every step of the way. If anything happens that's interesting with jury selection, I'll do an update video. We left off yesterday with Chad having his prompting that maybe it's time to move to Rexburg. He was at a gas station. A voice was like, you should move to Rexburg, all that jazz. So we're going to pick up there. I'll be playing a slideshow that I've done. I'll be cutting in and out with photos. All right, let's do this. When we left off, they had closed off on their house in early June. So let's look at some photos of this house. They're up here playing on the YouTube channel. A couple of the photos at the end are photos I took when I was there at Lori's sentencing last year. I have to say, it was a very heavy moment standing there. It was surreal. Words just can't describe it. I guess that's all I can say about it. Chad said, once we moved, I began working on my novel. It was a year overdue, but I started going to the David O. McKay Library on the BYUI campus each morning and working on it a few hours at a time. The final chapters seemed to be dictated to me by the spirit, and I typed as fast as I could. It was a unique experience to be writing about the BYU Idaho Center and to be able to see it out the library window as I did so. There were many indications that this is where the Lord wanted us. The move has opened up many opportunities for me in the publishing world. We had been warned it might be hard for the other family members to immediately find good jobs, but Tammy was quickly hired as an assistant librarian at the Madison Middle School. Tammy Daybell's sister said on Dateline last year that Chad actually wanted her family to make the move with them. Sometime in 2015, Lori starts reading Chad's books, and according to a friend, we talked about this yesterday, she becomes obsessed with them, especially that series called Standing in Holy Places. This next photo on this slideshow, by the way, is a very poignant photo for me. It was snapped by a friend of mine who was there with me as I just looked over the area where they found the bodies, and man, my heart was breaking. On body cam footage in January of 2019, after all this hit the fan and Lori tells Charles she's leaving him, Charles tells an officer that Lori's beliefs started changing between 2015 and 2016, where she crossed over into that more extremist view. But officially in June of 2015, Chad and Tammy make that move to Rexburg. July 28, 2015, Chad launches his blog, cdaybell.com. That day, he posted several entries. His first post on July 28th of 2015 is called One Foot in the Grave. I've read this book. Let me just tell you, I took one for the team. I do have an episode where I sum it up. I'll link that in the description. It took me about two hours, and I will never get those two hours of my life back. He explains this book is about his experiences as a cemetery sexton. In a description by Chad, it says the author shares his own cemetery blunders and bizarre experiences along the dealings with meddling spirits. He gives tips on how to outfox the Grim Reaper. This is a must read for anyone who isn't in the ground already. Then there is a note from the author. 
The original version of this book was released in 2001, soon after I'd retired after five years as a cemetery sexton. Then I took a job in the private sector without any intention of ever working in a graveyard again. Then the Great Recession struck and the business I was working for shut down. As luck would have it, the position of cemetery sexton was open at a different cemetery in the area. I applied and got the job and I worked for another five years and had several more entertaining and unforgettable experiences. In recent months, I felt it was now time to expand the original book by adding new anecdotes and updating several of the original stories. I hope you like the additions. Chad Daybell. September 16th, 2015, Chad writes a blog, Writing the Great Gathering. It says, soon after Tammy and I established Spring Creek Book Company, I knew I needed to begin working on my Standing in Holy Places series. I sensed the first novel should be called The Great Gathering and should be set 10 to 15 years in the future. Frankly, I didn't want to do it. I didn't feel it was the right time to release a novel about the decline and downfall of the United States. I put it off for a couple of years, focusing on other projects. The main problem I faced in 2005 was that writing about deplorable future conditions in America seemed ludicrous to even consider. People were building bigger houses, buying new cars, and loading up their 0% interest credit cards. Seemingly, everyone was prospering. At that time, the Middle East was relatively calm after the execution of Saddam Hussein. The thought of a group like ISIS gaining power seemed highly unlikely. Russia and China were keeping low profiles, and the United States was seemingly in control of the world. I've saved an article from that era when President George W. Bush visited Wall Street and held the strong state of the economy. He went on to say, As we begin this new year, America's businesses and entrepreneurs are creating new jobs every day. Workers are making more money. Their paychecks are going farther. Consumers are confident. Investors are optimistic. I continue to drag my feet on the novel, but my signal to devote my full attention to it came one morning when I traveled to San Pete County during the Manti pageant. Our company had a booth there where we sold our books to visitors. That morning, I passed the McDonald's restaurant on the south end of Ephraim and soon could see the Manti Temple in the distance. There were miles of empty fields to the west. Then it was like I was suddenly in a different time. I saw thousands of tents in those fields. They were clearly organized into blocks and wide pathways passed between them. I saw hundreds of people outside the tents. Some were performing chores while others were walking towards the temple. They seemed calm and happy. Then I nearly swerved off the road, which brought me back to the present day. The fields were empty again, but I took that as a message that I needed to get working on the great gathering. The book's cover image of a young girl in a wheat field is similar to what I was shown that day. As I worked on the novel, I would have glimpses of the Oval Office, but I would only see the back of the U.S. president's chair. I never saw his face, but I heard his eloquent speaking cadence and the phrases he used. The U.S. president in the book does not sound like President George W. Bush. Maybe that president still hasn't taken office, but when you read the quote in the novel, I think you'll agree it sure sounds like our current president. It was strange to write about President Gordon B. Hinckley's funeral in the opening segment. Readers rushed right past that part now, but when I wrote that, he was still a vibrant, healthy man. He didn't pass away until long after the novel had been released. I suppose I know how the writers of the movie Back to the Future 2 must have felt as they tried to accurately portray what life would be like in 2015. When they sent Marty McFly and Doc Brown into the future, they were incorrect on a few things. Flying cars, fax machines still being essential, the movie Jaws 19 and so on, but at least they had fun with it. That's what I attempted to do with the sport called Conquest in the book. I did see the traditional major sports leagues shutting down, but violent sports continued to thrive. We see the sports world heading in that direction as the top mixed martial arts events now often overshadow traditional sports. The most challenging part for me was writing about the upcoming foreign invasion of America. I have been shown several different snippets of destruction and terror in bigger U.S. cities, and then the invaders began moving inland. I did specifically see the scene where the tanks go into Spanish Fort Canyon only to have their paths blocked. It helped me to realize the Saints and Manti and in the camps near Soldier Summit would be protected. I didn't feel I could write extensively about the invasion, though, because I hadn't been shown many specific details. 
The military scenes I saw were mainly a montage of vehicles rolling through large cities and then rapidly spreading across the country. My dad helped edit the book, and he pointed out that it seemed like I was rushing through that part. We talked about expanding it, but that night the spirit told me, that's enough for now. A time will come when you can write about it with greater clarity. I had no idea what that answer meant, but it had been fulfilled in my new Times of Turmoil series. The three volumes all take place in the same time frame as The Great Gathering. I've been able to slow down the pace and better explain how the United Nations and the invading armies will work together. The Great Gathering actually sold really well right from the start, and when the Great Recession hit in 2008, many readers wondered if the things I described in my book were already starting to happen. I knew we were several years away, though, because one of the key parts of the book involves the government encouraging human microchip implants. Even today, some people will scoff at such a notion, but at least the technology exists now. I was relieved when both Julie Rowe and Hector Sosa mentioned seeing similar scenes involving the chip. Side note, Hector Sosa, associate of Chad's, we're not going to get too deep into who he is. There's one event I was shown that wasn't in the book, but goes along with this topic. Soon after I had my near-death experience in 1993, I was driving south along I-15 in Orem, Utah. I looked to the right and saw dozens of buildings comprising Geneva Steel, where my father worked. Then the scene changed, similar to what happened to me on the road near Manti. Suddenly, I had an unobstructed view all the way to Utah Lake. Geneva Steel's smokestack and large buildings were gone, and it looked like there were new subdivisions built on the land. I was told by the spirit that this transformation would happen before the major natural disasters hit Utah County. This actually came as a welcome vision because I couldn't imagine that scene happening for several years or even a few decades. Geneva Steel was doing well at the time, and even if it did shut down, it would take a monumental effort to clear away all of the buildings and equipment. That didn't include the challenge of removing all of the hazardous material to make the area habitable again. I just couldn't see any company or even the government spending the time and the effort to do that. Well, by the year 1999, Geneva still was struggling and it was officially shut down in 2001. Within about three years, a deal was worked out for companies from China and India to buy most of the steel making equipment. Other companies took care of the redevelopment of the land and now homes and businesses are found there. I hope it never comes across in this blog that I want bad things to happen. I much prefer a calm, peaceful life and a safe society. Oh boy, Chad, some of these writings did not age well there, buddy. He goes on to say, but when I drive that same stretch of I-15 in Orem as I did in 1993, the land where Geneva Steel once stood now matches what I saw then. He says, in the next post, I will share some ways I found to find joy in my daily life. I know troubles are coming, but marvelous events are also on the horizon. There's a bit of a gap here. He doesn't blog again until May 19th of 2017. We're going to get to that later on. October 15th of 2015, Chad begins his job as editor of a newspaper titled Global Research Initiative, which is part of the forum called LDS AVAL. We talked about AVAL yesterday. It's a community of like-minded people that are preppers that talk about how to prepare for the end of the world. At some point in 2016, Chad begins work as a sales executive at Falls Printing. Just for reference, in 2016, Lori was living in Hawaii with Charles, Tylee, JJ, and at one point, her oldest son, Colby, I know he moved back to the mainland before they did. Lori's friend, April Raymond, who was a big sweetheart, she lived in Hawaii at the same time Lori did. Their kids played together. She was on Dateline. She said that over the time that Charles and Lori lived in Hawaii, she noticed a change in Lori and Charles's relationship. April said she thought Lori felt superior religiously to Charles and that he wasn't on her level spiritually. Lori made clear she wanted a partner who was on her spiritual level. There are so many elements that go into this perfect storm, I think, that was Chad and Lori. And I think that is one. Charles did convert to the Mormon faith for Lori, but I think this is just one other example of the many things that contributed to Lori gravitating towards Chad when he walked in the picture. March 7th, 2017, Chad announces on his blog that he felt prompted to release a short autobiography called Living on the Edge of Heaven. The same day he blogs, it's here, my autobiography is now available. 
It focuses on the spiritual experiences I've had throughout my life, including my two near-death experiences. If you've read my novel, it will give you greater insight into why I wrote them and why I publish books by authors who have had similar experiences. I hope you enjoy it. July 28th. On July 28, 2017, he posted the behind the scenes for his book, Escape to Zion. Some interesting things that I pulled out of that. It says, as I constructed the plot of Escape to Zion, I turned to the scriptures and the words of the modern prophets. Admittedly, at first, I thought it was troubling to read many of the gloomy prophecies. Since I'm a young father who is trying to provide for his family, I certainly prefer the current world situation compared to what has been prophesized to come soon. But as I completed my research, I came away confident that although there will be times of trouble and trial, the future will be glorious for the Lord's followers. They will emerge purified from the troubled times, prepared to build new Jerusalem and usher in a new era of glory and peace. I hope Escape Design reflects the assurance that the Lord will care for his flock. Now, that blog post has quotes about visions and war and all that stuff, and we ain't going there. He goes on to say, despite the LDS Church's great investment in land and buildings in the Intermountain West, the Saints have always been taught that Jackson County, Missouri, is to be the church's final headquarters. Doctrine and Covenants 4571 says, And it shall come to pass that the righteous shall be gathered out from among all nations, and shall come to Zion, singing with songs of everlasting glory, of everlasting joy. It says the mission of the 144,000 high priests in escape to Zion. Doug Dalton is serving as one of this group. In DNC 7711, this group is defined during a question and answer session the prophet Joseph had with the Lord. The question, what are we to understand by sealing the 144,000 out of all the tribes of Israel, 12,000 out of every tribe? The answer, we are to understand that those who are sealed to this calling are high priests ordained unto the holy order of God to administer the everlasting gospel for they who are ordained out of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people by the angels to whom is given power over the nations of earth to bring as many as will come to the church of the firstborn. Orson Pratt taught that these men will be protected so that the power of death and plague that will go forth in those days sweeping over the nations of the earth will have no power over them. In parentheses, it has the Journal of Discourses, Volume 1825, given on April 11th, 1875. On the Lori side, December 17th of 2018, Charles looks into getting JJ a service dog. They get a cute dog named Bailey, a golden doodle. In fact, JJ slept through the night for the first time in a long time when he got Bailey. JJ had a tendency to wander off, and Bailey would alert Charles and Lori if he did. Later on, after Charles has been murdered and Lori is ready to move to Rexburg, she would try to sell Bailey online, y'all, before this is just shortly before JJ and Tylee were murdered. Luckily, the dog trainer saw this. You're not supposed to sell service dogs and got the dog. April 3rd, 2018. This is the date that Joe Ryan, the father of Tylee Ryan and the third husband of Lori, is found dead in his apartment. Lori told a family member that Joe was evil and that God took care of him. She admitted to someone that she did get a life insurance payout from his death, and she said she was going to share it with Tylee. I wouldn't bet half a penny that she did. June 2018, Chad finishes his book, Times of Turmoil, and said on his blog that he felt prompted to talk about it in July in Arizona. He contacts Melanie Gibb, and she sets up a speaking event with Chad and another person. Chad did speak at that event in Mesa, Arizona, July 13th, 2018. September 21st, 2018, Lori meets a man named Jason Mao in the celestial room at the temple. He wants to introduce Lori to Melanie Gibb. Jason Mao is ex-law enforcement. He did some podcasts with Lori and Melanie Gibb. And like a lot of these other people involved in the story, we're not going to dive in too deep with him. Before Lori and Chad meet, just some general things that we've learned over the years. Lori was spending four to five hours at the temple every single day. Just for reference, most people go maybe once a month. Lori would spend her time in the celestial room and communicate with those on the other side. Chad and Lori both believed that going to the temple regularly, it increased their vibrations and their ability to teleport. 
Lori was also sending 30 days supplies of food to her family in preparation for these tribulations on earth. Lori's nephew, Zach, he is the son of Lori's brother, Adam. He lived with Charles and Lori during this time, and he was on investigation discovery and said that Lori would say there are spirits around the house and once she got into an argument with the devil. September 24th, 2018, Tylee turns 16. Unfortunately, Tylee would be dead before her 17th birthday. October 1st, Lori emails Jason Mao and asked if he feels inspired to put her in touch with like-minded people because she would love that. Jason responds that he will pass her information on to Melanie Gibb. He also gives Lori the website preparingapeople.com and tells her there's a big expo in Mesa the month of November for like-minded people and says, you all should come. He said there's great speakers and events. And so it begins. We are getting into when Lori and Chad meet. Just for reference, at this point, October, at the point where Lori and Chad meet, one year later, four people would be dead at the hands of Lori, Chad, and Alex Cox, Lori's brother. One thing we have learned is among the group, there were up to 60, that's six zero, burner phones and over 30 email addresses. On October 4th, 2018, Lori meets Melanie Gibb. Now, in her testimony at Lori's trial last year, Melanie Gibb said she met Tylee a week or two after meeting Lori. She said Tylee seemed frustrated and upset with Lori most of the time and that there was tension in that relationship. She also met JJ around the same time. She said Lori was very affectionate and loving with JJ. She would sing him to sleep. But as time went on, Lori seemed frustrated with JJ and the interactions between Lori and JJ were very different. She said Lori was distracted. Also to note, JJ's autism medication was filled in January of 2019. It was never filled again. And when the search warrant was executed, Later on in November of 2019, looking for JJ, there were still 17 pills in that bottle. So the young man was not medicated. It seemed obvious to those who knew him and saw videos of him or talked to him. Melanie Gibb explains about the 144,000 to the jury that it's a group that would be here at the time when the Savior returns and would do missionary work throughout the world and would have a lot of spiritual endowment from above. She testified that Lori, pretty much as soon as they met, told her that Lori herself had a special mission here on Earth, which she was part of the 144,000. You see with Chad's writings and what she's told Melanie Gibb, this like-mindedness with Chad, fire, gasoline. October 19th, 2018. Lori gave her testimony at a gathering at Melanie Gibbs' home. Now, this is recorded on Lori's phone. Lori discusses turning her life over to the temple and about wanting to kill her ex-husband, Joe Ryan, if her bishop did not give her a temple recommend. Lori said, I was going to murder him. I was going to kill him like the scriptures say, like Nephi just killed, like Nephi, like Nephi killed just to stop the pain and to stop him from coming after me and to stop him from coming after my children. I would go through the scriptures and find all these things. If he comes at you once, if he comes at you twice, if he comes at you three times, then you can kill him. It says in the scriptures, it says it in the scriptures. She says, I did not have a murderous heart. I just wanted to stop the bleeding and stop the pain. I was like, I'm either going to turn my life to the temple or I'm going to commit murder. Lori was said to go to the temple. Around this time, Lori's niece, who I call Melanie's, starts spending more time with Lori. At this point, Melanie's is married to Brandon Boudreaux. He is the father of their four kids. Later on, Brandon would be shot at by Alex Cox. In fact, Lori's in Maricopa County, Arizona, facing charges for conspiracy to commit murder on Brandon, as well as fourth husband, Charles Vallow. I fully believe the reason to get rid of Brandon, that insurance policy. These people wanted their money. October 26th and 27th, the day that would change the lives of so many down the road. Chad is in St. George, Utah as a speaker at a prepper gathering. This is when Chad and Lori meet for the first time. It's been said they could have met earlier. We've never had confirmation of that. 
Melanie was with her at this conference, as was Melanie Gibb and Zulema. Zulema comes in later. She is part of the core group, and she can just, with her mind, conjure up earthquakes and tornadoes and all that stuff. These people, y'all. I don't know how you believe this stuff. Somebody come up to me and said they were the brother of Jesus in a past life. I'd tell them they were 50 shades of cray. Lori helped Chad to his car on that last day to load up books, and they flirted a bit. The same day, October 27th, Chad begins Googling Lori, Charles, her husband at the time, Alex Cox, Lori's brother, and Melanie's, Lori's niece. The next day, October 28th, Lori adds Chad to her contacts as Melanie 2, that's Melanie with an I, and another contact of his was Bishop Shumway. On October 30th, Chad emails Lori the light and dark ratings with a message. Here are the family history documents you requested. He rated her family on a light dark scale. So let's explain just a bit what that actually means for those of you not familiar with this story. Melanie Gibb testified at Lori's trial that shortly after meeting Chad, Lori told her spirits who signed a contract with the Savior before coming to this planet were light spirits. On the flip side, those who signed a contract with Satan were dark spirits. She told Melanie Gibbs she had learned this from Chad. So the numbers, a 2.0, that's your first time on Earth. A 3.1, this is your second time on Earth, and it's still not decided if that person is light or dark at this point. When you hit that 4.1 number, either you make a contract with Satan or with Jesus. You could go from light to dark back to light, but... Melanie Gibbs said it was pretty hard to do, almost impossible. There were also these trust scales that went from zero to 100% to see how much you could trust someone. As far as vibrations, Chad would use a pendulum. If you reach the level of 1,000, you're either beginning your translation or you are translated. As you get higher in your vibration, you could portal. How did Chad rank Lori's family members? To me, it's very clear of who Lori liked and who she didn't like in her family if you look at this list. Her father, Barry, he was a three light. Same for her mother, Janice. Same for her sister, Melanie's mother, who died at a young age. She was a three light on earth, but graduated to a 4.1 light. That's very, very high, by the way. Lori, of course, a 4.3 light. Her sister, Summer, is a three light. Summer's husband, a three light, but a borderline too dark. Lori's oldest son, Colby, that she adored, three light. However, his wife, three dark. Joe Ryan was a 4.3 dark. It says is now sealed away. Chad later told Zulema in December, Zulema being the one that can conjure up the earthquakes and the tornadoes, that he has the power to seal away evil spirits. Kylie Ryan, Lori's daughter, who would later be murdered, listed as a 4.1 dark. Now, in emails later on after Charles finds this list, he is pleading with Lori's family for help and specifically mentions she calls her daughter a dark spirit, help her. Everything went unanswered. Charles, interestingly enough, was a three light, eventually would be possessed by a zombie and turn dark. JJ was a 4.25 light. However, we know he became a dark spirit. Melanie was a three light. Her husband, a three dark. And Lori's dear brother, Alex, he was a 2.0. And we just talked about how 2.0s is your first time down here. Lori did teach this to the core group and also a few friends that Gib did a podcast with. The teachings about light and dark evolved over time, according to Melanie Gibb. Lori would tell her spirits could switch from light to dark. Once a dark spirit has entered the body, the real spirit is in limbo. So the physical body would need to be killed to get rid of the dark spirit that was possessing that body. And it would also free the real spirit, which was in limbo. Chad tells Lori in a past life they were married and their names were James and Elena. And let's just say... That is the names associated with the literary classic Chad wrote called Loinfire. If you don't know it, I'll tell you what, you're not missing much. And if you don't know what it's about, just think of that title and use your imagination. By the way, Elena was the daughter of Judas in a past life. Two of their children in a past life were JJ and Melanie. They were also parents to one of the dream girls and a tall high school quarterback. 
In another probation, Lori was Mary French, who was the wife to Robert Smith. Now get this, in a past life, Melanie Gibbs' parents were Mary French and Robert Smith. That would mean, in a past life, Lori was Melanie Gibbs' mama. Also in another life, Lori was the wife of Moroni. She was obsessed with that prophet, by the way. Halloween 2018, Chad activates a burner phone. He used a prepaid Cricket wireless account, and the name he used was Boyd Dial. It had a P.O. box in Arizona, and the phone was actually active only from July 1st, 2019 through October 8th of 2019. Lori entered this number into her contact list on July 2nd of 2019. It seems they only used this phone to communicate after Charles discovered the affair between Lori and Chad on June 29th of 2019. Within weeks of meeting Chad, Lori told Melanie Gibb that she and Chad were the head of the 144,000 to usher in the second coming of Christ. November 3rd, Zulema tells Lori that God told her she is Lori's protector. This is also said to be one of the first times Lori and Zulema discuss harming Charles. November 16th through 17th, 2018, Chad speaks at an event in Mesa, Arizona. It's another prepper event. This is the second time he meets Lori in person. And get this, y'all. He stayed at the house Lori shared with her husband, Charles. There is the infamous cookie picture of all of them gathered around eating Lori's famous cookies. At Lori's trial, Zulema said, I went to speak to Chad at his table and Lori spoke very sweet and invited me to come to her house because she was going to have a small gathering. Lori asked Charles to stay somewhere else because she was having people at her house for this conference. According to Zulema, Chad Daybell was one of those people. Zulema did go to Lori's house and there were several people in attendance, including Lori's murderous brother, Alex Cox, who is believed to be the ones who killed JJ and Tylee, and we know for a fact he fired the shot that killed Charles Vallow and fired the shot that luckily very narrowly missed Brandon Boudreaux. At this time at Lori's house, Zulema went to the backyard with Lori and Chad. Lori was playing basketball and, of course, asked Chad if he wanted to play. Zulema said she felt like a third wheel. Now, Chad said initially he was going to go inside, and Lori says, well, why are you scared of me? So, of course, they stayed outside. That night, Chad gave Zulema a blessing. Lori was in attendance when that happened. And during that blessing, he told Zulema how amazing she was and how grateful he was to know her. They love bomb people. They make you feel like you're the most important thing in the world. And I think if you look at everybody who was in this group, they were kind of a band of misfits and they bought it. Later on, detectives find audio on Lori's iCloud from November 17th, 2018 of Chad's speech. He claims to be a visionary after his near-death experience where he jumped off that 60-foot cliff and his bell got all ripped up and he had a foot on the other side. He said his spirit separated from his body and he had contact with dead family members who were in heaven. He said this event is what led him to become an author. There's audio saved on Lori's phone just from the event in general as well. What does it mean to be sealed to someone? Because guess what? In November of 2018, Lori and Chad go to a temple. And according to Lori, Moroni gave Lori to Chad. They say the Savior was there as well. They believe they had been married in other probations. And Lori had lived on 21 planets and Chad 31. On one of those planets, he was the Holy Ghost, by the way, in case you did not know that. Chad has lived five times on this earth, Lori four. At this point, Chad makes a portal in Lori's closet so she can visit him. At this point, Lori thinks she does not have to go potty. She doesn't have to eat anymore. She is this translated being. What does it mean to be sealed together? Melanie Gibb explained to the jury that when you're sealed to a companion on earth, you are sealed for all time and eternity. I said on a live the other day, there is probably not enough sage in the world to cleanse that temple of what they did in there. Also around this time, Lori told Melanie Gibb that her and Chad were very much in love in spite of the fact they had only known each other just a few weeks. We're going to stop there. We're going to keep going tomorrow in this crazy story. You know, every sentence I say on these episodes, I could expand for 30 minutes on each one. But don't forget the Connecting the Dots series. The first parts when my old co-host Fruit Loop was on there. I plan to redo that episode with everything we learn at these trials, but that'll be a ways down the road. So that's it for today. Come join us in chat live. We are watching jury selection. 
Hope you guys have a good rest of your evening.